Production funding for QED with Dr. B is provided by American Electric Power Foundation, boundless energy for brighter futures, and by viewers like you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Frederick Bertley, immunologist and educator. Science is everywhere and for everyone, and it's all around us, shaping our lives every single day. In this series, we'll look at cutting-edge research, talk to the scientists who are charting new frontiers, and solving today's problems to make all our lives better. When a scientist or mathematician demonstrates a proof of concept in their work, they often use the term QED, quad erat demonstratum. That roughly translates to quite easily demonstrated. Welcome to QED with Dr. B. Hey, Dr. B, how are you doing today? Good, how are you doing, Dana? What are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to talk about the science of stress. Stress always seems to be kind of like the bad guy in an action film. It's like wreaking havoc, it's popping up when you don't want it or you least expect it. But now scientists are saying that stress isn't always the bad guy, right? Yeah, I mean stress is really this cool universe of co almost conflicting ideas. There is definitely bad stress, that's chronic long-term stress. But we've also heard of this fight or flight syndrome. That's really an acute stress response that's based back to our evolutionary selective kind of tendency that in a pinch, if something's really dramatic, a beer's coming at you, you gotta react quickly without thinking about it. What's happening right now with scientists from around the world from multidisciplines is they're looking at this acute fight or flight syndrome and they're unpacking and seeing that, wait a minute, acute stress actually has some really cool benefits that we're gonna explore. And actually our first guest experienced acute stress, short-term stress firsthand when she competed for and actually won the Miss America title. Talk about a dramatic, stressful thing competing for not just a big competition, but Miss America. You're talking about Camille Schreier and hearing her talk about kind of her scientific approach to understanding stress while dealing with what has to be a very stressful event like Miss America, really cool. For the record, you are an accomplished scientist. You have two bachelor's degrees in science and you're pursuing a PhD in pharmacology. Just let me slam that, mic drop that moment to say that's incredible. The fact that you're a scientist, did that help you on, on kind of managing stress through the pageantry tree because you kind of understood at least some of the chemistry behind it, the biochemistry? Having a scientific mindset when you're going in to solve a problem helps to reduce the overall stress of the entire situation. And I think that one of the biggest ways that I manage my stress is to actively prevent it from occurring, especially in those situations. So the more prepared I am, the less stress I'm going to actually encounter. And I always say that I use the scientific method to help me win Miss America because I kind of observed what was going around me and I researched ways that I could participate in Miss America without a traditional performing talent. I decided to do this science demonstration to solve my problem and really approach this in a logistical way as any scientist would and I think that that's what helped me get through it, be successful and uh, reduce the stress along the way. Can you talk to us about a specific moment during that Miss America process where you were stressed and then how you got through it? The most stressful moment through that process actually related to my talent performance. And mostly because candidates don't oftentimes do a science demonstration on the Miss America stage. The catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is the chemistry demonstration by Camille Schreier, Miss Virginia. there wasn't a lot of precedent for me to understand how to do this logistically. And so the logistics were the most stressful process of that because I had to figure out, first of all, what demonstration I could do within the guidelines because I could not use fire, I could not use certain things because of safety. But also I had to travel to Connecticut from Virginia. I could not fly with my chemicals. I had to figure out what I would do in terms of how I would clean them, how I would clean them up off of the stage, what type of personal protective equipment I needed to provide the staff and myself. Now in my flasks are concentrated hydrogen peroxide, food coloring, and dish soap. I'm about to pour in potassium iodide, my catalyst, which will start the breakdown. 
Now this reaction is very simple. It only produces three things. Water, oxygen, gas, and heat. The heat is formed from the breaking of the bonds within the hydrogen. It was definitely a stressful process, uh, especially during that live telecast when you know that you are presenting yourself in front of who knows how many million people on a national broadcast. And I think that my body just kind of went into, you know, a power mode. I'm just going to get through this. I'm not really thinking about it, but I was on high alert. I was backstage during a commercial break, quite literally shaking because of my actual biological stress response and trying to pour these chemicals with shaky hands because I was excited and overwhelmed. Never did I imagine in my life that I would be pouring chemicals backstage on a live telecast to win Miss America. But that is something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And keep an eye out because science really is all around us. And it was a very stressful situation, but positive stress. And I think that that's one of the things that I've realized throughout this whole process is that some stress is positive and some stress is negative. And that was definitely a positive stressor, but stressful nonetheless. You actually constructed this really complicated, very stressful process of your talent. Can you talk to us about that in yeah. the context of picking the higher stress road instead of the path of least resistance? I think in moments where you are trying to put your best foot forward and you're trying to compete for this once in a lifetime opportunity, I went in with the mindset that I was never gonna change who I was and that I wanted to be 100% myself because if I won that competition, I wanted to make sure that who I was was really, really represented. I've loved science since I was a little girl, and now I have the opportunity to pursue the career in science that I had always dreamed of. And so I chose that demonstration, not really considering the difficulty or the stressfulness of it, but because I knew that it was the best representation of who I was. And I think that that's so important throughout our lives to not just make choices because they are easy, but to make choices based upon who we are, what our values are, and what we're trying to do in our lives. What I really loved about Camille Schreier is not only did she do a science experiment for her talent, but she also is kind of breaking the mold for young women all over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. There's a fantastic study called the Draw a Scientist Test that was done in 1983. And basically, they went around the country and they asked different students in the K through 12 range to draw what they thought a scientist looked like. And as you can imagine, almost always the picture came up of an older white gentleman with a beard, thick glasses, and a, and a lab coat. And that was the typical idea of what a scientist was. But what Camille Schreier is doing and other persons like herself, they're really breaking that stereotype. They're saying, listen, you can be a geeky, nerdy scientist, that's great, but you can be a pageant queen. You can love makeup, you can love fashion, you can love basketball, music, you can love anything but still be interested in science. And people like her are breaking that stereotype. It's so nice to see her do that. But what is really cool, or when you go to these girls' schools and you ask them to draw their favorite scientists, today, more and more of these young ladies are actually drawing women, which is really nice to see. And I really love that Camille used her science background and her knowledge of it to be able to help her cope with the stress that she felt during the competition. And actually, that's a great segue to our next guest. And that's right. We're talking about Dr. Jeremy Jameson, who's at the University of Rochester, studies psychology, and he studies the regulation of stress. So talk to us about our perception or attitudes when things are happening and we think things are stressful. How does that manifest in how we respond further to actual stressful things like a pageant or a bear coming to engulf us? Yeah, so um, a lot of the models I work off of, they're called biopsychosocial models. I mean, it's a really long word, but we unpack that word here, biological processes, psychological processes, and social situational processes. These things all interact together to produce um, a stress response um, in a given situation. And so in that model, the idea is that we first encounter a stressor. So something's presenting demands, we have to engage with it. And so once you engage, that's going to get the sympathetic um, nervous system online. We can choose not to engage. If you're a student, you can choose not to answer your questions on your test and just walk out of the room. I mean, that's not going to be very helpful for your long term <laughs> pursuit, but you could do that. And that might lead to more stress later on. Yeah, <laughs> ultimately, that's probably going to not be the most functional, that thing to do. But um, when we engage with something, we're sort of like, okay, I'm engaging with this, this situation. And from there, we have these cognitive appraisal processes. In appraisals, um, these are sort of perceptions we have. 
And the perceptions are about perceptions of demands. So what am I presented with relative to my resources? What do I have to address those demands? So resources can be things like social coping resources. Do I have teammates to rely on? Do I have other people helping me? They can be my skills, my learned ability, anything like that. Familiarity with the situation is a resource. And demands are like the actual stressor that's presented with us. It could be like, am I trying to impress these people? I'm in a competition. Am I trying to beat this player in this tournament? Am I trying to do well in this test? Like the actual exam questions on a test would be the demands. And it said, did I study enough? Do I know this material? That's the resources I have. And it's really about a ratio of demands to resources. If we think we have sufficient resources to address these demands, it doesn't matter if the demands are high. So it doesn't matter if the stressful situation is, is very demanding. If we think we can handle it, our bodies can respond to challenge response. Alternatively, if we think that we can't handle it, our body's going to engage in all these responses to try to mitigate expected defeat and damage. And so the, the response is coming from this ratio of resources to demands. Our brain's doing this really under the surface, really automatically. Is there another way that we could learn or teach kids going through school, teach undergraduates, teach graduates, this whole stress axis piece that you're talking about, that along with, of course, learning the content, if you master the, the pathophysiology, if you will, of stress, you might actually be acing exams just in general. Plus, if you know the content, you might be even better. Is there something there? Yeah, this is something we can do. So a lot of research I do is looking at ways to developing stress regulation tools. And a lot of what we do aim at is that academic stressors. What we do is we try to teach people what are their ideas about stress. Like we have this process about stress of being stressed. Yes, yes. And we see this pop all the time. People worry about if I get into this high agitated state, that means that I'm nervous, I'm a failure, I'm not going to do well. Interpreting that response as negative, that can produce some of these negative downstream responses in the stress systems. And so the idea is sort of getting people away from equating stress with distress. That's a big challenge. No one says I'm so stressed when they're excited. People say I'm so stressed when they're overwhelmed. Stressors are demands. It could be like a real, like a sort of um, negative stressor, but it can be positive as well. A lot of we're focusing on academically is that to sort of achieve and like break boundaries and help us grow and learn and get these really major goals, we kind of need to engage with stressors. We need to do things that are hard. And so teach people about the stress response and how it can be helpful to facilitating the goals they want to achieve. And so what we've pinned this as called stress optimization. Challenge is generally pretty good for performance. To your point, how do we shift that threat to challenge? How can we kind of do mindful mental exercises to get there? What we try to do is teach people that the actual response your body's having is a resource. This is helping you achieve your goals. This is not something to sort of run from and be scared from. We're sort of harnessing stress to help people innovate and thrive. And so this is a different approach than coping. Like coping implies just getting by. Like I'm gonna deal with the stress, I'm gonna be over soon, and I'll, I'll cope with it. What we're talking about is optimizing. So sort of leaning into it. And so sort of using that stress as a tool. What we need to do is sort of get people to engage with stressors in positive ways, but then give them tools to maintain that challenge response through adversity or through difficulties. We need to push forward with that and sure. sort of be, get beyond our comfort zones. No one ever innovated something by staying within their comfort zone. So when I get stressed, my heart kind of beats a little bit faster. Sometimes I get butterflies on my stomach and sometimes my breathing gets a little shallow but those things seem kind of hard to quantify. How do you scientifically measure stress? Actually, you can absolutely measure stress scientifically. The first thing that happens is your adrenal gland pumps out adrenaline, we've all heard about that. And that gets your heart racing really fast, you vasodilate, blood's coursing through your body, you get nervous, agitated, that gets you ready to deal with whatever stressors coming on. Um, but then after that, the second hormone that comes in is cortisol. This cortisol will continuously be released until the brain sees that the stressor has stopped and then it will shut off the production. So how do you measure cortisol? The funny thing is you can measure cortisol in so many different areas in your body. In your blood, in your sweat, in your urine. You can even measure cortisol in the hair. 
At The Ohio State University, we have the Stress Science Laboratory that actually measures levels of stress in all these modalities. In fact, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jody Ford, who actually works in that laboratory with colleagues all around the world measuring cortisol. There's this thing called the Stress Science Laboratory. What is that? So it is a consortium of our colleagues and faculty in the College of Nursing. We have a variety of faculty who are interested in doing research with stress. How do you measure stress? What are you looking for? And how do you make sense of it all? So we've been able to start to collect and measure cortisol in hair. Hair is a great medium because it, it grows about a centimeter a month. So and sometimes. Sometimes, yes. <laughs> so it grows about a centimeter a month. It gives us the average cortisol over that period of time. We use a process called an ELISA assay and it actually will allow us to measure cortisol. You can measure hormones, a, lot, a variety of other kinds of stress hormones or inflammatory biomarkers. And we can use those, looking at them as how much they might predict your health. So like your blood pressure could be even considered a biomarker. It's a measure of your health, your biology of what's going on. I mean, that's really cool. And I know from the diabetes space, you know, they have these cool glucometers, almost cool patches that you can actually wear and check your sugar levels yes. throughout the day and really mon and monitor that. Is there going to come a time where we're going to have a, a stress meter that I'll put like a little patch on my shoulder and I can study it myself and say, okay, wait a minute, this is going into the red zone. I need to calm down or, or I'm green, I'm happy. Do you think that could actually happen? Yes, I do. I think I'll be here before probably we know it. I think there's a lot of work going on in trying measuring biosensors and a lot of it is primarily right now for research purposes but it will go mainstream. I mean, if you think even about some of the wearable devices we have now to measure our fitness, and a lot of them are really moving forward and being able to capture your heart rate, heart rate variability, because heart rate variability is a measure of that kind of sympathetic nervous system response, that pattern of the flight or fight thing. So you can see some abnormalities in how your heart beat changes with stress, and, it, and it's being able to pick up that kind of the part of that stress response system. What's the relationship between stress and actually our health? There's a strong relationship between stress and health. Of course, acute stress is adaptive. It's gonna save our life if something is happening and we need to get out of the way of a car coming at us. What can be a concern is if it kind of goes into more of a chronic stress where you have these chronic events that are happening, repeated events. Your body then just continues to stay in overdrive in the stress response. Over time, it doesn't impact your immune system. And so what we will see is that higher levels often of inflammation and and that inflammation increases risk for cardiovascular disease. We can see an increased risk with some cancers, very strong relationship with mental health disorders. So talk about stress in the context of our social implications, the stigmas, people having real disease, but they're mediated not because of any fault in themselves, for example, but just because of their macro environment and micro environment might be really stressful. We all have stress, and but the stress is not distributed equally among our population. So people obviously and um, are, are born into more adverse situations. They may be born into ha having living in a poverty or a higher violent neighborhood. And we certainly see uh, stigma and, and racism have an impact on stress. These stressors can accumulate and impact health cumulatively, but we can also see that there's more sensitive periods of development as well in early childhood when the brain is really developing at a rapid pace and as well as adolescence, because adolescence is another period with all the hormonal changes and there's a lot of brain changes and frontal lobe changes during adolescence. It's kind of another sensitive period that when you encounter a lot of stressors, it can actually have a greater impact than it might at a different time point in your life. Depending what you're born into, um, that may actually, and it's not an excuse, but it might be an explanation for some of the violent behavior or poor choices that we see different members of community making. Is that can, can that be an argument? Yes, definitely. My background is in nursing and I was a pediatric nurse practitioner in primary care. And so a lot of the work that we did with adolescents, you know, is, is focusing on health behaviors. I think everybody can recognize when you're under stress, you may be more likely to want to overeat. It's often um, people will, will engage in substance use and that can actually suppress that kind of feeling bad and making them feel better. Negative behaviors can be in response to stress. Certainly we can see it as well with how it might impact lots of other decision-making processes about how people are, are responding in the moment to a stressful situation. There's a lot of issues with hypervigilance as well. I mean, you kind of are always on edge of wondering if something's going to happen and just kind of 
uh, you're just kind of having to be vigilant and, and on, on edge all the time. This is fascinating. It really draws a nice connection between science, biology, physiology, our bodies, and the reality of certain social circumstances of how we go about our day-to-day -day living. So Dr. B, you're an immunologist. What effects does stress have on the immune system? So one really important thing we have to remember with the immune system is it responds really well to all kinds of different hormones. And so depending on the acute form of stress or chronic, you'll have a differentiated response. So for example, some impacts on the immune system can be immunosuppressive, dampen your immune system, while some can actually enhance it, make it stronger. And that really depends on what exactly is happening in that stress ecosystem. So we had the pleasure of speaking to an expert in this matter, Dr. Dabar, at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. You're an expert immunologist, and um, not only do you talk about short-term stress can be helpful and beneficial, but in terms of the immune response, talk about how short-term stress impacts the immune system and how that may be beneficial to us. So our immune system is, is I, I just think, a beautiful, amazing, intelligent, adaptable defense force. I'm sure you appreciate that too. So we specifically define short-term or acute stress as that which induces changes that last for minutes to hours in duration. So how does the short-term stress response enhance the immune system? At the very beginning of a short-term stress response, say within a few minutes of the, after the stress response begins, you see a large increase in immune cell numbers in the blood. So immune cell numbers in the blood increase. Taking a little bit of poetic license, I describe this as the body's soldiers leaving their barracks, which is organs like the spleen, the marginated pool, and the bone marrow, and entering the body's boulevards, okay, the bloodstream. Approximately 30 to 60 minutes after the stress response has started, one observes a large decrease in numbers of immune cells in the blood. Now, before our studies, many people believed that this decrease was further evidence that stress is necessarily bad or harmful. Mm -hmm. That stress was suppressing immune function by decreasing the numbers of immune cells or soldiers in our bodies. However, if you think about it, you wonder, why would an organism, including humans, invest so much time, energy, and resources into building exquisite, powerful immune defense systems only to destroy those defense forces during times of stress or trouble? Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that many times of trouble or stress also happen to be times when an organism is likely to need its immune system to protect it from wounding and infection, which often occur during stressful situations. And this suggests that Mother Nature would want to enhance an immune response under short-term stress conditions rather than suppress it. So with this reasoning in mind, we hypothesize that the short-term stress-induced decrease in numbers of immune cells that we saw in the blood may not represent a net destruction or loss of cells from the body, but instead may represent the fact that the immune system soldiers, the body soldiers, are now leaving the boulevards, they're leaving the blood vessels, and taking up positions in the body where there could be potential battlefields. Mm -hmm. And then we identified that the skin and lymph nodes are target organs, are some target organs to which those immune cells traffic during short-term stress. But we also conducted studies then to see whether immune function was indeed enhanced in compartments like the skin to which the cells traffic. Mm -hmm. And we found that that was indeed the case. Us as individuals, can we minimize bad stress responses and optimize good stress responses? So based on our studies, we've developed the concept of the stress spectrum that says that for good mental and physical health, we need to minimize chronic or bad stress. We need to optimize short-term or good stress. And we need to maximize our green zone of low or no stress. So how do you do this? Briefly, we have proposed that we have to work on and harness three banks of factors while we do this. Okay. The first bank of factors consists of lifestyle factors, and these are sleep, nutrition, and exercise or physical activity. The second bank of factors you know, consists of psychosocial factors. So these are factors such as appraisal, coping, perspective. Let's just take appraisal for example. So you're driving on the highway and uh, someone cuts you off. And this is where your appraisal and perspective come in. 
I'm not even going to let my stress response begin for this over this little thing. And then the third bank of factors represents activities that you could engage in. Now, most of the time when you think about stress reduction, you think about the activities, and that's very important. But it's important to remember that we have deliberately proposed a model where we say it's lifestyle, psychosocial factors, and the activities. And the activities can be things such as mindfulness, meditation, yoga. The factors don't have to be contemplative. It could be dance, music, singing, engaging with art, nature, being in the outdoors, going for a walk. All those activities can be helpful. And the one thing that I'll take a minute to, to explain is that be open to your stress-reducing activity being something that you might not expect. And for me, I found out several years ago that teaching, teaching was part of it. In many ways, there are so many benefits because I love being with my students. I love interacting with, with people that there is a tremendous sort of stress balancing in a strange way that goes on for me with that. And I, and I love to tell my students, you know, just, just be excited by the beauty of biology. Let yourself be amazed. So now it's time for our takeaways from today. Mine is a whole new appreciation for what the body does and its response to short-term and long-term stress. So stress is this multidisciplinary kind of ecosystem filled with all these hormones that, that populates our body, but how we respond to it depends on a lot of our psyche as well. And it's good to understand the difference between good and bad stress, but also just how to manage stress, right? And that's the key, and that's quite easily demonstrated. QED with Dr. B, that's me. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we'll see you next time. Catalyst, which will start the breakdown. Now this reaction is very simple. It only produces three things, water, oxygen, gas, and heat. The heat is formed from the breaking of the bonds within the hydrogen peroxide molecule, and the oxygen gas is trapped in the disc soap, which forms the foam so we can see how far the reaction has progressed. Science really is all around us. Production funding for QED with Dr. B is provided by American Electric Power Foundation, boundless energy for brighter futures, and by viewers like you. Thank you.